Good morning. Uh, we are going to start. Uh, welcome to the session of Expanding Opportunities for Alternative Education. My name is Felipe Barrera. I am professor at Peabody and Vanderbilt University. And it's my pleasure to uh, kind of guide uh, this session. So uh, we are going to start with a new commitment announcement. Uh, I want to invite to the stage Michael DiGrano and Leo Schwartz uh, from Rockland Community College. Uh, what is the challenge that they are trying to do? Michael and Leo uh, have made a commitment to address the following challenge. Uh, students who are at risk and in low-income communities have often a, 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 are often unable to find a path to higher education either because the cost of a school is too high or because the associated data is prohibited or because the guidance support that they have in high school is not present. Uh, a, a lot of uh, multiple barriers to go to higher uh, level education. And this is to the needs resources tailored to their circumstances if they don't, uh, if they have to, if they uh, have to chance to go to for their, their education. So how is the commitment, the commitment called CC Success uh, is working in a solution. So first of all, CC Success created a pathway to higher education for at risk and low income high school students through outreach program that discuss options to attending a, a higher education. The option, one of the options is to go to community uh, college and then to transfer to a four a year institution. The, the team will partner with local high school and community college to develop a student support networks. And this commitment aims to reduce inequality by helping students pursue higher education. Success will be measured by the number of students enrolling in community college, as well as changes in attitude from the possibility of obtaining post-secondary education. Congratulations to both of you. Uh, and here are the certificates uh, for Michael and Lyra. It's amazing the job that you are doing, guys. Um, so now I want to invite uh, to our panel. Uh, we have three people who are extraordinary, who are doing work in the ground and doing uh, an amazing job. So I want to invite to the, pa uh, to the podium Pastana Durrani, uh, uh, David Bart, and Daniel De La, de la Fuente. Um, And uh, please, each of you, take a minute to briefly introduce yourself, telling us what uh, you do and why. Uh, so let's start with uh, Prastana. Thank you. Um, am I audible? Can, okay, yeah, you can hear me now. <laughs> Hi, my name is Prastana Durrani. I am a social and political rights activist from Afghanistan. I run a small nonprofit called Learn Afghanistan. We focus on girls' education through digital literacy and digital tools. And right now we have three schools in Afghanistan that are teaching girls in secondary level in a country that has banned education for girls right now. So we teach around 230 kids, young girls, uh, from grade seven to grade 12. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, and I, I, I couldn't be happier to be here with this panel and with all of you. My name is David Barth. I'm the head of international programs for Save the Children U.S., which is, as many of you might know, is a part of uh, the world's largest network of, uh, of NGOs in service uh, uh, around the rights of children. Uh, a substantial portion of what we do uh, takes place in humanitarian conflicts, in hu humanitarian contexts, and central to that is uh, the urgency to make sure that, that children's learning and their emotional and social uh, and, and social adaptation isn't interrupted uh, in a world that is progressively getting harder and harder to be a child. Hi everyone, Danielle De La Fuente. So excited to be here today. Um, I run a Mall Alliance. We're an international NGO. 
that aims to empower displaced and disenfranchised children by providing four pillars of support. So we focus on social and emotional learning, early childhood development, psychosocial support, and peace education, predominantly in refugee camps, but also in the formal systems. Uh, excellent. Um, as I was telling you, I am Felipe Barrera. Uh, I am a researcher, and I am so excited to be here uh, because I think that the, the union between research and what people are doing in the ground is very important. Um, but let me, let me start with a couple of questions. I'm going to have one question to each of you. Let me start with David. David, um, we are currently facing a global learning crisis. Uh, what does that mean and what is at stake? Uh, if you can give us a <laughs> general perspective of this simple question. Yeah, it's not a simple question, unfortunately. And, and, and we're, you know, and at first I would say we are facing a global learning crisis. It is part of a mosaic of challenges that, that children face. And I think all of us need to come into the conversation saying the well being of a child has education as a component, but not the only component. Because what we're seeing in a world that is emerging haphazardly out of, out of pandemic, but in a world where we're seeing increased manifestations of, of climate-related natural disaster, and a real expansion of conflict from where we were 15 years ago. Um, it is becoming harder and harder to be a child uh, in, in many places on the globe. Uh, the learning crisis itself is maybe a little bit neglected by the international community as some of these more, oftentimes more dramatic uh, issues are, are illustrated. Uh, whether it's the global hunger crisis or, again, the, the scenes of violent conflict. Uh, but it is essential and vital that, the, that children's access to learning and the sense of well-being that comes to, them, comes to them from being part of a community where they have caregivers who, who have the tools, the time, the energy to show them love, to make them safe, um, is, is immensely important because they are not gonna be able to transition successfully into adulthood without those two components. Yes, there's the material question of what are they learning uh, and the cost of having that learning interrupted and for 1.6 billion children that learning was interrupted and we've seen tremendous backsliding in terms of, um, in terms of learning loss, but also their well-being. And I, I, I suspect I speak for both of you in saying, at Save the Children, we know that every child who comes into our care, 100% of them, have suffered trauma and have been the victim of some form of discrimination. Um, they, they have been oftentimes abandoned by a system that was designed to be caring for them and it's failed them. And the question underlying that is why? Why is it in a world of affluence are we not able to provide the minimum things we need for, for a child's whole well-being, inclusive of education? So it is a, it's an urgent question. It's the question of our day. It's a generational question. Um, and it's one that is not without a solution. So I mean, again, I, I, I talked about our relative affluence. When I started 100 years ago, the, there was often a, we, we would often talk about scarcity. Oh, we can't do that, we just don't have the resources. Our world does not have a scarcity problem. It has a choice-making problem. And we choose to allow these children to be excluded from the basic systems that will allow them to grow into uh, into healthy citizens. And so uh, it is a crisis. The numbers are stark. I think we can get distracted by saying 20 million here and 50 million there and 1.6 billion over there. The principle, though, is why is it not universally understood that um, children are being deprived of core aspects of what they need for their own well being and development? And these are things that we have said as an international community are rights, our fundamental rights. But it's a lot easier to say something's a right than to actually treat it as if it's one. And I think that's the conversation um, that we all need to be, to, be, to be pushing in big places, at the General Assembly and with the UN and with NGOs, but in households and communities and everywhere up and down the line that um, educating a child is not an option. Educating a child is not an option. And it's all children. And that includes the ones who are hardest. So children with developmental disabilities or who have access issues. Every one of them has a co-equal right to these basic services um, that we have historically failed to provide them and now have gotten worse in spaces because of these, because of climate, because of crisis, because of, because of COVID. 
it's so interesting the uh, the idea of choice uh, it resonates a lot um, and I am going to go further when we uh, have more time to go into that idea but I want to ask Pastana uh, like to go deeper in that question uh, in the sense that you have been working in Afghanistan and you have taken this impossible task of uh, teaching girls and young women uh, who have effectively lost the right of, of education in your, in your country. Tell us how is this, how do you see the state of education in Afghanistan and, and walk us through how you have been able to create uh, the country first digital school network. Thank you so much. Um, okay. I have to learn this. Uh, first of all, we have to understand that education in Afghanistan is not an Im impossible task. It's possible because it's happening for the past two decades, first of all, and it has been happening for the past 100 uh, years in Afghanistan. Uh, 100 years ago, in 1919, we had a first queen, education minister, Queen Soraya, while in the West, people were still struggling to give women the right to vote. So I think for me, my country was well, well ahead of its time, you know? So now coming back to is it impossible to educate a girl in Afghanistan right now? No, but it does take a lot of resources. It does take a lot of will. It does take a lot of people. It takes a village to educate a child in Afghanistan. And I think for me, it was only possible because A, I'm stubborn and strong-headed, and all of us are at this point. So I took in the initiative of our government being corrupt. People are like, oh, how do you deal with the fallen? I'm like, I have been dealing with men <laughs> way before that, corrupt men. <laughs> so I know how to deal with that. So in 2017, my first, my own cousin was not able to go to school because the government thought that our district was not entitled to a school. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to challenge that. So I did go to uh, Kabul. I did challenge them politically, but I also went on not to wait for that policy to be changed or not to see if the investigation goes on. I built my own school. I started with her, and we did it together. It was never meant to be something big. It was not meant to become learn was meant to educate her, that's it. But then when we started uh, researching, I found out that ruler tribal Afghans like us, who come from the mountains, are actually looked down upon because, yes, we can speak English because we learned it from TV or in a school in a refugee camp, but we are still not one of the elite uh, community members. So for me, I was like, okay, we need to challenge that. And I think challenging made it um, more possible for me. Um, but educating a girl in Afghanistan is not impossible. It's hard, but not impossible. And for me, I think right now, all these 230 girls, every time when they show up to school, that's a huge commitment to learning. That's a huge commitment from all their parents who are sending a daughter to school in a country where you don't have the right to be in that class, where you don't have the right once you get graduated to work in that country, and they still are hoping. So who am I to stop it, you know? So I continue to do the same thing what they expect me to do, yeah. That, that's amazing, that's, that's really, really amazing. Um, and, and this idea that, first of all, that there is possibility to do action, and secondly, not to wait, but to create the change is, is very important. So, Daniel, and again, same similar question. You have a lot of experience in refugee camps. Uh, tell us how education happened in a, <laughs> a refugee camp, and what innovations have been successful in expanding education access to displaced children, and what needs uh, uh, remains unmet. Thank you so much for the question. Um, so education in a refugee camp, um, I think we let, let's take a step back. Life in a refugee camp is not easy. The circumstances are dire. Um, you have hygiene issues. You have terrible living conditions. Um, but I think the best way to describe sort of what I, even why we exist, is the first time I stepped into a refugee camp. So this was at the peak of the Syrian refugee crisis. I was traveling to Greece, and so I wanted to understand what did the children go through, what was their experience, and so I visited a camp for the very first time. 
And I was not prepared for what I saw. It was these horrible little tents. You know, I'm not very tall, and I was taller than these tents. And I'm like, wow, there's four people living in this. Um, and, and by the way, not every refugee camp is the same. This experience was one in, in Greece. Um, but the circumstances were not nice. And I was talking to the children and learning about their experience. They had all experienced severe trauma, under, undergoing toxic stress, um, and they didn't have access to, to education at that point, because even though, in that sense, the Greek state was offering education, most of the time they didn't have transportation to get there, or they weren't even in the system yet, so then they couldn't even get into it. So, And there were actors, there were NGOs providing uh, education programs, whether it be in non-formal spaces or even just play-based approaches so that children could play. Um, but I, one thing that really stood out to me was there was very limited sanitation and there was a sort of like a porta potty situation and nobody was using it. Um, and so I asked one of the, the kids, you know, why is no one using the, the one area that you can actually kind of go to have a bit of a dignified, you know, bathroom situation? And they said, no, 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 bad things happen in the bathroom. And, um, and I was like, well, tell me more about these bad things. And so very quickly I learned about the sexual abuse that was happening in this camp. And, I was horrified. I'd been there 30 minutes, and I learned about the bad things happening in the bathroom. So I realized that even though there were lots of players that were trying to provide assistance, it wasn't so much of an intersectoral approach. It was this person doing this, and this NGO doing this, and nobody was really communicating. So that was actually the birth of our organization, because we wanted to provide um, First, just a safe space so where children could heal and process what they had lived and then have that opportunity to an education. So if you don't have access to the formal system, well, what will help you get there, right? So what will help you get those basics, those foundational skills that will at least make you employable in a future um, and set you up on a pathway to success? Now, in terms of successful programs, there's a lot. You know, there's so many great NGOs, small NGOs doing things on the ground, but oftentimes those don't get to scale. So they're, you know, a small shop, they're doing great things, very localized. And so some of the bigger programs that get to scale, some great examples are like the Better Learning Program from Norwegian Refugee Council, um, even uh, Save the Children's Aulas de Paz in Colombia, team, uh, War Child's Team Up. So, I think it's really important to understand there are amazing actors on the ground doing great things every single day, but they're not necessarily the, they're the unspoken heroes that you just don't hear about because they don't have the resources to do evidence-based testing that will eventually allow them to be uptaken by a national scale. So the players that you do hear about are usually the very well-established organizations that have these programs that can cross boundaries. Um, but I think it's important to note that there are educational opportunities happening every day. And um, and they're not your conventional you know, situation. There might not be a school that you think about. It might be you know, a caregiver with five children or um, a mom that decided to become a teacher of sorts. And so really kind of opening your mind to education can look very different in many different settings. Um, and just how children learn. And I'll toss it back to you. Also very interesting. Uh, and let me ask one question to David, and then I'm going to this conversation from my mind uh, with different questions. But let me let me go, David, and then I will want to, to ask your question to the three of you. So David, Save the Children works to ensure that no child, children learning to stop due to crisis or conflict. How are you working towards this goal and what has been successful? Well, the, the, the number one and most successful <clears throat> model is to have as many brilliant, thoughtful, committed community-based partners as you can find. And so, the, so that's, the, the, and that's whatever sector you're working in. You know, we, we were talking a little earlier that the, the title of the session was Alternative Education. And you rightfully called out, like, what, is that, what does that word mean? We don't love that word. What we're talking about in a lot of camps is the alternative to a complete absence of education, right? But long term, the objective is every child, every adolescent has access to a free, high quality, non discriminatory, safe, uh, integrated education system. And those 
by and large, I think the consensus is those 10 should be public systems. We find ourselves, though, in a world where the, the absence of those systems require these alternatives. And, and um, while we all try and come up with innovations, and, and, and to your point, kids are ready to learn, and most people not, and most, most people intuitively are halfway down the road of knowing how to teach. Little, you know, they, they need some additional tools and some additional training and investment and time. But we, we've been teaching children successfully since Pythagoras. Like we know how to, we, we can get kids to read. Um, but what the, the space that needs investment is in, is in this question of the alternative to the absence of education. And for children who have been um, displaced for whatever reason, and so we've spent a lot of time in thinking through a couple of key interventions that can intercept that child who is alone or who's been held out. And oftentimes these are outside of school, things like one of the things we, you know, like we call them catch-up clubs or whatever, where you have an informal arrangement that welcomes children, and it can be five of them, and they don't require a trained teacher, but they're given the materials so that they can they can be assessed at what level their learning is, not by their age, but by what level their learning is. Because you can be, if you're a 13 year old who's reading at a second grade level, you don't, you know, you're going to need different supports than you would be a 13 year old who's reading at a sixth grade level. Um, and to put them in situations where they have access to the materials they've been deprived of, <clears throat> but always with the goal of getting them back into formal education as a transition, as a, uh, a transitory kind of step. Uh, you can provide the tools and you can create those safe spaces. You need to make sure that that travels with the psychosocial piece and that you're doing um, a little bit more sophisticated sort of case management around, around, around the safeguarding and well-being of those children. If you want young women to show up to an educational space, you need to have a clean latrine. The distance from home can't be too far. They need to have role models and people they feel safe with. They need to be getting education, not just in getting them to third grade reading level, but also about their, you know, their, the life transition, their puberty, their, um, and, and cultural issues. So um, sometimes the best thing we can do is sort of show what is happening in other places. You talk about Colombia. You mentioned this earlier. Like, no, Colombia is not the same thing as Syria. It's not the same thing as Yemen. It's not the same thing as Afghanistan. But there are some through some through threads, and so. Among those through threads, helping kids accelerate their learning, pressing on government to make sure they're rebuilding those public education systems is where children should be, um, making sure that in those places where children will gather, they're safe, they're being taught more than just the mechanics of, of reading and math, but about um, who they are in society, their own agency, um, their own dignity and rights. That combined, you know, can, can get us a little bit of the way back. It's not in and of itself a magic, you know, solution, but it does stop the backsliding and allow for that transition back into a formal system. Very, very interesting. I am learning a lot with this session. So it, let me ask one question to any of you uh, that wants to take it. One common thread in the answers is the following. We are teaching uh, our young uh, generation so that they will have opportunities to the future. So, and we are, we are thinking about, for instance, kids that are displaced and in places that are usually not their own uh, country or uh, usually. Have you think about this problem that, hey, we are teaching these kids and they need to have a future, for instance, in the labor force and the, how do we do that? How, how do we solve that transition? Yes, we are teaching the kids, uh, well, let's hope that we can be able to teach the kids. How can we t give them options so that they can be successful later in life? I'm happy to jump in here. Um, so I think one of those is offering skills that really can be transferable from different environments. So oftentimes when you're talking with children on the move, 
they're in continuous movement. So maybe where they're learning at that point might not be where they're going to be in two years. But if you teach them skills that they can take with them that are actually skills that employers are looking for in the future, like creativity, empathy, teamwork, planning skills, these are things that it doesn't matter what context you're in. You're really creating that critical thinking necessary for a child to be able to face any challenge that comes up along their way. And I'll open the floor for anyone else. I think um, I might add to that is like one thing we have to understand that in the next 10 years, the world is going to be different. There's going to be a new industry. I'm a very pragmatic person, <laughs> so I like to catch up with times. And especially when you're from Gen Z, you know that the world is transitioning all around you all the time. So what do you do? First of all, it doesn't have to be that you need to be fully ready for the future. So you don't have to be fully ready. You can, however, do your own research. The minute you know how to read and write, it's the minute you need to understand your own pathway. You don't have to rely on a huge system to become the person that you want to be. It's a good thing to have, but most countries don't have that. So how do you challenge that? How do you transition from that? Let me give you an example of myself. I grew up in a refugee camp. Um, we used to drive, my father used to drive us to school 30 minutes each side, and it was only allowed like one hour of TV every week on Sunday. So we had to go to school f six days a week, um, and it was not easy, but I didn't learn much in the school either, I'm going to be honest. What did I learn at home was actually my father giving me books, random books. I read history, I read geography. I didn't read Cinderella or Snow White, no. I read about uh, Afghan women in the ancient times, how they led all the army and how they fought in wars or how they managed schools, how they sent women to Turkey to learn. So that helped me understand, okay, this is not something new. We have been done, doing this for a long time. And I'm not, in, not a very big fan of uh, like, you know, inventing new wheels. No, you should work with the tools that you have. So I think for me, my students who are learning right now in my schools, I'm giving them all the tools. Now it's up to them how to utilize them, how to use them, how to transition with that. And I think we need to be good at that system. We need to provide the tools available, but we also need to give them that free space for them to make that world, to make that industry in the next 10 years. Very, very cool. Um, another, another common uh, thread in, in, in the answers is the following. It seems that what we need is very atomized, very decentralized uh, system in which there are a lot of initiatives coming out. That, that can be a possibility, that a lot of uh, initiatives from the, from, the, from the ground, from the communities, and that will have an impact. That posed the problem of uh, how we organize that very complex system. How, how can we organize all these initiatives? There are a lot of people in the audience that have very, a lot of initiatives that are coming out. How, how is the mechanism that we can organize all these initiatives? Or do we need to organize them? Or just we just allow that uh, type of natural growth to, to happen. I don't know if someone has any ideas about this one. I can jump in quickly, but I, I'd be fascinated to hear what you think. You know, um, you talked about technology. It is, it is much easier now to unite around the power of people with a shared vision in space than it was 20 years ago, okay? 20 years ago, you'd have to fly in on a bumpy flight to some place like here, and hopefully you meet somebody and you give up business cards and maybe they call, you know. The system now, you guys can find each other. Um, th yes, there's an umbrella organization here which has brought us all together, and that's a really vital function, but the, 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 the next burden of building out a community is on each of you to say, you know, who do I want to be my fellow travelers in this journey? What, what, is, what matters to me and are there other people that it matters to? I guarantee you there are other people that it matters to because um, there is a universe of like best practices and new interventions. They are widely available. They are not hidden, they're not secret. But, but putting together the, both the mass of service providers but also the advocates who can help change systems is where the action is going to be. And so that is a little bit of a, of a, you know, of a request to all of you to 
as you think about the questions in your own commitments, spend some time thinking about who you want on the journey with you. Um, and the more, the closer they are to the children that you want to see served, the better. The closer they are to the communities, the better. So, because like I said, there are, there are a lot of global assets, they're out there, we can find them together, um, but you're, the power in your network is gonna be kind of local to global. And I'd love to second that. So there is real power in partnerships and networks. And I think it's really important to learn early on. There's no one solution that's going to solve all the problems that we have ahead of ourselves. We really need to build on each other's core competencies. So once you start learning, like, oh, maybe this organization does something fascinating in health, and maybe this one does something in protection, and, oh, we're working in the mindfulness space. How can we all work together? What's our common goal that unites us? And how can we really complement each other's efforts? And I think also when you're thinking of partnerships, you need to make sure that wherever you're working, the government, the private sector, the NGOs, they're all involved because each of them play a real role. So if you start a program, eventually you want it to grow, right? If the government's not on board, if they're not at least somehow involved or aware, you're, you need to set yourself up for success. And so building those partnerships really early on. So do your due diligence, do your research, understand who are the players in the field, what they're doing, how it works with what you're doing, and just approach them. It all starts with a conversation. Hey, I'm doing this and you know we're doing this in Afghanistan how can we work together and and then it's amazing what can blossom when partnerships take full bloom I think as a young person when I started learn um, I was 16 17 and I was very strong -headed. I didn't listen to a lot of uh, what was told to me because I didn't also believe in it because I was like, that has not worked in my community. How do you expect me to actually make sure that it's working now? So um, sometimes it's good to challenge stuff. Sometimes it's good to question stuff. Um, but at the same time, you have to understand a few things. You need to have a mentor. As she said, you need to have a mentor. Reach out to people. If, we, if people are not nice to you, or if the mentor who was your hero didn't, didn't uh, turn out to be the hero that you thought, follow them, follow their journey. We all use Twitter, we all use Instagram, follow that journey. Learn from that. That's a big learning material you could have. Second, read books. Read a lot of books. I have read so many books on education in Afghanistan, I can practically name you 20. Do that for your own community. If there are no books, well then start focusing on one, write one, talk about it, research about it. Last but not the least, best community practices that have been taught within your own community before you go out on this best model practice, you know? What has been taught in your family? what has been taught in your community. We do poetry sessions in our communities where every night after like, you know, we are done with dinner, we do poetry sessions in our families. So we would listen to BBC radio and then we would do poetry in Persian and Pashto. Maybe you have a model like that, maybe focus on that. That could be a good start. So for you, it's all important. But when you're four into years into your journey, you'll need to have some time to your own self. So focus on mindfulness, focus on peace, um, calmness, focus on how to be more present, to concentrate more. And I kid you not, there will be times where you would be happy that Monday is there and you'll be starting working on the stuff that you like. So you have to have your own person and your organization doesn't have to consume you, but also you have to make sure that when there's need for challenge, you do that and you question it. Can I quickly add, can I quickly add one thing? Don't be afraid to fail. So it's very easy to come to these uh, panels and see, oh, they're doing this amazing project and they're doing this great thing. Yes, but to get there, it was a long journey. And there were a lot of failures along the way. And so it's very okay to ask for help. It's very okay to communicate and say, hey, I'm working on this and it's really not working out. Like I saw that you did this really well. How did you do it? So don't be afraid of that bumpy journey. They always tell us in these things that we, you know, that failing fast is a good thing to talk about. I think this, the, the question to the question you were initially raised and you followed up on. Um, I think we as a, I think we as a whole ecosystem, certainly in the places I've been, we've really failed at the transition of adolescence into the workforce body of work. It's been a, you know, I, I, I and it's a, you know, it's a sin I'm going to carry with myself that I have, I have supported the training of a lot of young people for jobs that never got. 
And so understanding the dynamic, you've got, and, and you learn. You say, well, I, I didn't have, I didn't understand the market. I, the Ministry of Labor, you know, had some other plan. Um, the quality of the material wasn't any good. The, the kids weren't that interested in it. Well, there are a million reasons, but you got to be honest with yourself and say, you know, we've been really good at getting third graders to learn how to read. We have not been really good at, at getting adolescents to transition successfully into the workforce. And again, maybe because it's just not a core competency of the traditional international development model. But if we're going to be, a, if we're, if we're going to talk about education, it is education for a purpose. And one of the big purposes is citizenship. Um, but in order to be a productive citizen, a great thing to be, to have is a job. And, and so like, I would say, you know, there are spaces we still have to get a lot better in. Yes, that, and that, that that is one of the most challenging points uh, uh, that I think that uh, it has to be in a space of young people thinking is how can we make the transition to 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 the labor uh, force uh, more successful, uh, and that is something that that I think is uh, very important. Uh, that open two discussions. Let me start with the first one. Uh, Daniel, what is the role of the, of education in the sense that uh, education should be more than cognitive uh, learning, uh, socio-emotional learning, citizenship? So what, in your experience, how do we do that? And, 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 and uh, what are the importance uh, of, of all these skills that are very different from cognitive only? Well, so we, we definitely believe that social and emotional learning is the precursor to any type of learning. And uh, let me explain why. Um, so as I mentioned, as you've heard, um, children that have you know experienced trauma and toxic stress and adversity, they find it very hard to learn and to connect with their peers. And so this, you might put a child in a classroom, but does that mean that they're actually learning? And I think now with the pandemic, um, I think most children around the world have now experienced to some degree what other children in, in crisis conflicts have experienced because they were out of school, right? And so now they're coming back to school, but they're dealing with anxiety and depression and their mind's not like, okay, well now I'm ready to learn math. And so unless you really understand how to first identify your emotions. You might be angry, you might be frustrated. You might only know that there's five emotions instead of you know a, a whirlwind of uh, different emotions. So first identifying that, then learning how to manage that emotion and how it affects others. So maybe what I'm feeling and my actions are gonna affect others. So that empathetic aspect, the compassion. And then how do you work with people that are different from you? So how do you, you have a goal, you have a plan, but Maybe there's someone from a different color, from a different religion. How can you all work together? These are all those social and emotional skills that need to be taught, that unfortunately are not usually in the education systems. And so I think the pandemic did us one favor that brought to attention like, hey, this is important. Maybe we need to talk about this. Maybe we need to look at mental health and well-being before learning. But systems take a long time to change. And oftentimes these are add-on programs. It's a, the after school model. It really hasn't been integrated into the system. But I think if we're thinking of learning as a whole, we need to look at a whole child development approach. And that definitely means the mind, the body, and, um, and the spirit. And so we focus on the well-being and the emotional side of things because we know that a child that's emotionally resilient is going to be more ready to learn, more apt to receive information. Um, and they're also just going to be more successful adults that are going to know how to navigate any of life's circumstances and be able to be a team player and integrate into the society that they're in now, but also a society that they might be in in the future. Um, so that's why social and emotional learning is so important. Oh, and I forgot to mention, it's a very good way of rebuilding trusting relationships. So oftentimes you've experienced trauma, you, you don't feel safe, you're in this state of fear and uh, fight, flight or fright. So it, it just kind of allows children to really understand that they can build trusting relationships and form those bonds again that kind of bring them back to course. Very interesting. Uh, in the line of work that I do, we are thinking about two things that are different, which is mental space. Kids cannot learn because they don't have the mental space, either because they're preoccupied because of the situation or poverty or 
the other one is, hey, how can we equip these kids with socio-emotional skills that allow them to work later in society, in the labor force, et cetera, et cetera. But th th those are, it seems that you are thinking that this is a dual thing that, that you need to, 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 to put. Um, so that is, a, that, that also opened the discussion of Save the children and your school, but the, how are you thinking about this problem of socio-emotional skills? I think for us, it's a different situation. So for us, thinking about other stuff right now is sort of luxury because being in that school is a big privilege. I'm gonna be honest, being in that space, out of all those millions of girls, just you being selected to be sitting there and everything is paid for is a big privilege. So for me, it's a bit different when I talk about like, you know, what could be done. But um, yes, one thing I do believe is that young girls do need access to that whole holistic approach where you do know that the girls are going through something, especially in their teenage ages when they're right in the 13 and they are, their body's changing, their mind is changing. They have all these hormonal things going on, but then at the same time, they can't go to school and now they're going to a school, but it's a secret school. So all of that is happening. Happening. But at the same time, you have to make sure as an educator, are you just a teacher or are you making sure that this person carries the torch further? So for me, all my students are the future leaders of Afghanistan. For me, I have to make sure that they have the space, they have access to learning, they have free time to watch cartoons on that laptop when they can, they have access to internet when they want, they know how to use Gmail, all those things are important for me. At times, we make sure that the kids do talk to the teachers. We cannot afford a therapist right now, but that's the best we could offer. At times, I talk to them. So for me, that's all important. For me, asking them, okay, what is happening? There are kids who are coming from homes where they're not fed for days. Because as you might know in Afghanistan, the first daughter is the sort of like the second mother. So she is the last one always to be fed, you know? The brother has to get fed. The younger siblings have to get fed. And then the daughter is going to be fed. Sometimes there's not a lot left for them. So you have to think about all of that. Is she fed? Is she, does she have enough clothes? Does she have enough pads? In this morning, I was trying to struggle with someone in Egypt who was trying to send uh, boxes to Afghanistan, which is like menstrual hygiene projects, you know? So sometimes you have to think about all of those things. You have to think about a laptop. You have to think about internet. You have to think about a, a girl whose father is a drug addict. You cannot give her a laptop, so you have to negotiate some time from her chores so that she could stay in school and use the laptop because her father is going to take the laptop and sell it for drugs. So you have to think of all those stuff. Of course, I think of it on a micro level because that's what I do. Um, but I think we have to understand that children come from different backgrounds. They need a support system, not just an educational system. They need a support system to thrive in the next 10, 20 years. Sean, I think what you, what you said is, is so important because in many ways, Afghanistan today is sort of it's got all, it's got all the challenges. You know, it's got bits of every. We've got a hunger crisis. We've got a very cold winter. We've got a, a diffident government that is hostile to girls' education. You've got you know um, uh, you're, you're you're in con you're in conflict recovery, persistent in some spaces. Um, but that idea of you know, it, it's it's proven to be very powerful for particularly for for young women, but for, for every child, to have both of the trusted adult, but also successful near peers, yes. maybe a year older or maybe two years older, yes. and so the function of a near peer in providing a little inspiration and some confidence. We were talking about confidence earlier and how important that is. Like, you know, it's not there's no um, you can't sign up for a course like that in most schools, but it may be the most important thing that a young person can learn, um, is all sort of a contribution to helping in transition. So if we're gonna, you know, and this is not, and we talk about, we're talking about Afghanistan um, because it has so many of these elements, but it's, you know, it's, um, it's Nashville and it's Baltimore and I'm from Detroit, it's Detroit. 
and it's every place where you guys are from. There are you know there are that that children have adverse experiences in their life and need the security of knowing that they are not a prisoner of their history, yes. that their future is in front of them and hasn't been written yet. And exactly. but absent the confidence and the the sense of security, you know, uh, so a lot of these kids don't think they can do it. Yeah. I just want to add to that as like it's not it doesn't have to be a girl in Afghanistan who is going to go to bed hungry. It could be someone in the US. I was working in West Virginia with these families and there are families where the kids actually the mother parks in uh, a McDonald's uh, parking because the kid has to upload uh, his homework. They didn't have access to internet. So I'm not, yes, Afghanistan, because I come from Afghanistan, it's my history and heritage and everything. But imagine in the US, a child has to go through that. In the US, you know? So there are a lot of like you know, challenges in all over the world, but we have to come up with solutions. We have to make sure that we don't fail the next generation that we, we have been fa failing them for the past, I don't know how many years, yeah. Can I, can I just add to something? I think Prashana made a really important point about um, education in general about girls and boys education is not necessarily equal and so whether you're talking about uh, Afghanistan or we work in Bangladesh and in Uganda oftentimes girls just don't have the same access to screen time so if it's a tech program you have to think about it well you might be providing a solution and it's really helpful but at the same time you might be actually creating a bigger divide if the girls don't have access and so really being conscious and mindful and intentional about your design of how you're going to deliver your intervention or your solution, because there are factors that play into that. Yeah, and just a, a quick follow on there, I think the next, the, or maybe the current frontier in discrimination is technological discrimination. And I think <laughs> um, technology can help bring learning to places where it hadn't gone before, but it is also gonna be much more, it's gonna exclude a lot more if we're not very mindful yeah. about building out broadband, about giving access to at least to you know, appropriate technologies for, for different environments. And that's a space where we can all be, be active in calling out. When someone comes to you and says, well, I just developed this new app to do this great thing in education, you say, well, okay, but, but who's that really gonna serve, yeah. right? They have electricity. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> is, the app, is the app the thing that really is gonna solve the problem? Because once again, they're, you know, whether it's the kid in the parking lot at the McDonald's <laughs> trying, to, trying to wave their laptop to get a Wi-Fi signal or, or um, any of the children that we see anywhere, you know, um, we're, we're, we're seeing, le and I, I was at a dinner and we were talking about the new PISA and TIMS tests and how uh, they're going to be online and they're going to be uh, this, this great new analytics and this fantastic data. I was like, yeah, but now you are further compounding yeah. all the kids who aren't going to get, and their schools who aren't going to get good PISA and TIMS results yeah. because they can't do it. Something that is interesting about this conversation is that there are common problems that doesn't matter the context that we are facing. And, and we, we need to start thinking of solutions that are for those common uh, problems. Of course, the solution have to be tailored to the specific context, but the common thread that you said, David, is, is very, is, is there. The, 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 the problems that we are facing in education are very similar. It doesn't matter if you are in the United States or if you are in Afghanistan. Of course, there is component problems. There is, but but clearly there are some common thread uh, uh, in this in this in this discussion. Um, one question for the three of you, and before we open uh, to the to the public uh, question, is the following. Tell us some of the most creative solutions you have seen for education access, either at the community or organizational level. So, um, and, and I want to, to, to expand that uh, question not only to access, but also to, let's say, learning. Yeah. So what is, what is the most creative solution that you have seen? This is important for a crowd like this because this is where the potential of innovation exists that we know of, and, and I think that, that that will be an important, uh, it will be important to hear what, what, are you, what have you been found in the field. 
So for fear of self-promotion, uh, <laughs> so we won uh, UNA UNHCR's COVID-19 challenge in 2020 to design an education and emergency prototype. So really think of innovative solutions that address a common problem across different contexts in um, displaced populations. And so our solution, Colors of Kindness, has been sort of a very innovative approach to addressing this. Um, it's, it's very cute. We have these uh, gender neutral blobs. Uh, we use podcast instruction. We have a digital workbook. So it does work on an ed tech platform, but it also works offline. So our learning management system does cater to audiences that are um, that don't necessarily have access to internet. And so one of the reasons I would sort of feature it as a innovative solution was we first piloted in Bangladesh about two years ago. Um, since then, it's also been piloted in, in Uganda and in Greece, but more recently, the Greek government asked us to scale it to all schools within Greece. So as of September, we now have it in every single school um, in the country. That's a very rapid scale that's usually unheard of in the education space. It takes a long time. You have to get your evidence. You have to scale in one location. You can't cross uh, boundaries. But I think the reason it's been able to scale quickly is because it addresses a common problem, that you have children that aren't necessarily learning because they're dealing with all of this anxiety, and they, and they, they need to build their emotional intelligence prior to learning. So I would I would bring our solution as one. Um, but, um, but there's a lot of really fantastic solutions out there. And I think um, looking at those accelerators and incubators that exist, this is where some of these great ideas get born. Um, but they, they're not necessarily a brand new idea. They're using the tools that already exist. So leveraging what's already there, but in a different way of presenting it. So uh, I think for me, I, I'm going to be honest, we cannot be telling everyone, oh, we have to come with this uniform solution and we have to do it for everyone. No. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, we run a school, again, self-promotion, again. <laughs> but um, we run a school, 230 girls are getting educated, but at the same time, there's another school, Code to uh, Inspire, and they're doing it in Herat. They're doing it on small scale, but when their kids graduate, they come and teach in our classes. So their teacher is teaching in our school in Bamiyan. She's in Herat, and she teaches in Bamiyan, which is like a long distance if you have been to Afghanistan. So um, does that work? Yes. One is creating the workforce. The other is hiring the workforce. And they're generating more workforce. So yes, we need all those sort of solutions. There is another boarding school in Afghanistan, which is now in Rwanda. And it's uh, called the School of Leadership Afghanistan, SOLA. And they only take a few students you know, um, every year. But is it a scalable solution? No, maybe not. But is it a good solution? Yes, because it's going to take all these girls who are going to get politically educated and going to come back to Afghanistan one day and have a different uh, sort of like, you know, plans for Afghanistan. So we need that sort of like, you know, small solutions under a big umbrella. I, I wish there was a framework for Afghanistan like that. Um, but in other parts of the world, I think there are uh, uh, like you know organizations who take all these small solutions and make sure that they are allied with each other and work together. So I think for me that those all those things are important. But you asked a very important question about learning. Now thinking about um, Gen Z, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to flaunt it again and again because I was born in '97, so <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, now. Thinking about how learning is affected or how can learning be done, it's important. My father learned in a school where there was one blackboard and one teacher and they would beat him with sticks and stuff. That's how they learned. I learned from EDX and Coursera. My first course I took was learning how to learn. I'm a totally different person. I learned about my PCOS condition on uh, Instagram. I learned how to use that. So when people challenge you on, oh, you cannot learn from Instagram, I question that. Uh, you cannot learn from Twitter. I question that. Do we need more of proper content? Do we need fact checking? Do we need more lesson learning? Do we need to have impro uh, in, like improved channels on those platforms? Yes. Um, but is it impossible to not learn on those channels? No. Um, at the same time, now going back to conflict zones. Um, we run the school, again, self-promotion, but that's happening. Now, I don't want to leave out all the children all over Afghanistan. What's the next best thing happening in Afghanistan? Radio. 
it's very halal in all of our households. It's acceptable all over. All grandfathers listen to it. BBC and Voice of America are the two things that all of them listen to. What did we do? We partnered up with a national radio, that's Mashal Radio and Azadi Radio, and we gave them everything free of cost. Children now every day, girls, boys, young, old, can actually access that education R in both native languages and can learn from it. And the lessons engagement is 4.8 million, which is exemplary. Is it something that could be done on a massive scale? Yes. Can we maybe certify people? Maybe not, maybe yes, it's a question. But are people learning? Yes, because every fr Friday we have this call-in section where people call in and they're like, oh, on this day we had this question and they, I couldn't solve it. Can you help me solve this? So we have to understand, we have to go for all sorts of solutions. We have to make sure that all of us are in this together and it's not a competition. My NG is better than yours, that doesn't work. No, you're working on this, I'm working on this, let's join forces. That's how the world is gonna change, yeah. Even if, you're, even if your NGO is better than the other ones. <laughs> I know. Um, you've said some super powerful things. I would just uh, you know, say, like, the, we think a lot about multiple modalities in place, and Afghanistan's a perfect example, where some people have access to TV, most people have access to radio, not everybody has access to broadband. You want to be seeking out some combination of those tools, SMS, yeah. that supplements, that is a reminder, that prompts, that spurs some creativity, or a conversation, or some poetry, or someone sings a song, or like all of that is learning. And you also made the point that schooling and learning are not the same thing. Yeah. You know, if being in a school but not learning anything, that's daycare, that's not learning, okay? Um, and you know that the technologies be appropriate is really important. We, you know, during during COVID, we ended up uh, training and deploying uh, uh, essentially a, a battalion of camel libraries. You know, libraries just packed on the back of camels to deal in Ethiopia with with, with pastoralist communities because that was the technology. That was the one that was going to reach them. Other places, you got radio speakers on the back of a pickup truck because that's the, that's the technology. Um, you don't have to. You always want to be aspiring to improve it but you gotta be asset-based. So always in your work, I, I, this is a general lesson I would leave with you if, I, if you permit me. As you're taking on these challenges, don't be deficit-focused. Don't go into a community and say, this is what they're missing. Yeah. That's the wrong way to look at a problem. When you go in there, there's something that, that, want, that the community has said want, they want to see progress on, start with what they have. And if it's parents who care about their children's education, that's a great asset. If it's a little piece of land, that's a great asset. If it's um, the natural beauty of the place they live, that's an asset. Start out with your assets. Uh, and if it's, you know, you need a library on the back of a camel, then yeah. that's where the way you're gonna go. If, you, if you've got access to Coursera, you know, that's a shortcut. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, very good. Last question for uh, the three of you. Well, David answered the question, so let me hear Pastana and Danielle. What are the... Um, advice for this audience of young people who are in the process of developing and scaling their own impactful projects? What would you say? And then we open the discussions uh, to them. So last word of wisdom uh, of what is the advice? Be bold and stay true to your idea. Um, so I think everyone said it already more eloquently. Build those partnerships, find those great solutions, see how you can contribute. Everyone has something unique to offer, so but just just stay true to your idea because from one thing leads to another, and and just show your passion and be bold about it. I think for me, I would say that you need to understand the first thing. You need to do a needs assessment for your own self and the community. Okay, do I need to? Uh, education is such a. I'm gonna say it the way it is. It's a trending topic. Everyone wants to talk about education, development, everything of that sort. Is it really needed in that community that you're working with? If so, what is the level of the need? Is it, as you said, they are not secure at all? There is no school? Yes, there is a need. Um, maybe there is a school. You could improve maybe some of the things. So you have to do all of those needs assessment. You can't go in like, oh, um, I'm just going to be an educational leader. That's not how it works. <laughs> it's very inspiring. It gets you places. I went to Geneva, <laughs> so you can go places. But at the same time, you have to understand, is it a need in your community? If it is, what level is it? What could be done to improve that? And how could you be a catalyst 
in that process. Because you, when you're going in, you're not supposed to slow the process. You have to make sure that it's more efficient. You are bringing in your solutions. I know it's a lot of pressure, but one thing that we are blessed in this uh, age is that we can bring in offline apps where it's possible. We could take camels and bring those offline devices to those communities at times. Um, so you have to make sure that you challenge yourself first. You do the innovative uh, part of it. You don't have to go and make an app. Use the resources available to you. Please don't be a app maker. Just go with what is available. And then at the same you, you guys can make an app. Don't worry. They both are disappointed. They're like, what? <laughs> if it, I mean, if it's in your native language, if there's a need for an app where, yeah, I want to teach in my own community, in my own language, then do it. But if there's something available, please improve that. Please don't waste your resources. Those are the important things you need to do. And most importantly, find a mentor, focus on your mental health. Those are very important things. Very good. Um, one, one topic that, that happened that, that was mentioned here is, guys, failure is OK. It's okay. You keep trying, and and there are some moments in which there are no success, but you keep trying anyway. So, let me open for questions of the public. Um, and you have a fantastic uh, panel here. Um, use it. So, who wants? Ooh, very good. If this were my class, I will be super happy. So, <laughs> let me let me take let me take one. Two and three questions at the beginning. Uh, you in red. Okay. And then here is the. the Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure. There we go. Um, my name is Amy, and I'm coming from Northwestern University. And first of all, thank you all so much for taking the time to be on this panel today. This was so incredibly just informative and interesting. Um, but I want to ask, you all mentioned a big plurality of risk factors to education, like the bad things that happen in the bathroom or food insecurity at home um, that lead to that state of toxic stress that's antithetical to actually learning when you're in the classroom. And I guess my question is, like, what's the role of the educational NGO in looking at some of these upstream um, contextual factors? And what effective interventions have you seen in upstream, um, upstream prevention? So I think when you're thinking of psychosocial support, um, there's a there's a famous pyramid of four different levels, right? And so you have the first two bottom levels are a bit more community-based interventions, and then they get more specialized. And of course, you made a comment like we don't have a therapist. So I think it's really um, important to understand that not all solutions are going to address all levels of psychosocial support because whatever one child might have experienced might not be the same degree that another child. But if you provide a space where children are starting to understand and process what they've lived, um, some of those more exceptional cases that need additional support become very apparent. And so in our case, we, for instance, focus on three levels of the psychosocial support, but we don't have the, we don't focus on the top here, tier. But when we train teachers, we train them how to identify some of these cases, these special cases. And then um, once that's identified, then you can send them along to the appropriate party. So whether it be a Save the Children that might have the more specialized training or UNICEF, but then that's where the partnerships come into play, right? So, um, so in our case, we can't provide that additional support, but we know how to channel the child so that they can have that additional support. Yeah, I would just say it. I would just say it's, it, it, it is an obligation of the NGO to understand the circumstances of that child. And there's only so much that can happen inside of a, a classroom or inside of a, uh, a child-friendly space. Um, and that's where the, this question of how interesting are your partnerships becomes important. Because you know we found that one of the principal ways to improve the educational experience is cash and voucher assistance to the family. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's not an educational intervention. It's not, you know. Uh, getting the right book on the camel, it is recognizing that child is part of a family that needs cash voucher assistance. And, and then you say, well, who's doing that? Who does it well? Who does it in a way that doesn't endanger the, you know, a, a woman-headed household? It's a, you know, they're all unique circumstances. It doesn't have to be your expertise. But your expertise, your obligation in the education space is understand the circumstance of every child. Very good. 
Vanessa Kia. Yeah, hello, my name is Zekia. I'm Professor Felipe's student in data class. Um, so my question is, um, how are we supposed to ensure that alternative education opportunities are implemented, I implemented in a way that is equitable and just, um, and just yeah, that's my question. I, uh, I think uh, we have to understand that sometimes, like, you know, when you have these national policies, educate everyone and not educating everyone, right? So uh, I think if it's in your own community and you are the one who's taking the initiative, um, it's sort of your responsibility. Like, I feel responsible for all the kids that we educate, right? We are making sure it's an obligation. You have to make sure that they have that space. So for th the same, I think, would be for anyone taking any sort of initiative is making sure, OK, it might not be accessible to everyone, but have you done everything to make it accessible? That's the important question. Um, sometimes I have seen like you know st uh, kids who are not able to access um, all these spaces because they're not like you know disability uh, accessible. That's important. Sometimes there are uh, meetings on Zoom where there's no interpreter or sign language interpreter. That's wrong, right? But we have to understand this thing. The first time you listen to that, next time you should be addressing that question. Yes, there are times where we are going to lack support, but you should be the next time it's needed, you should be there for that. I think that's the most normal way to go about it. You can never cover everything. That's a reality, but you could do your best. I think that would be yeah. very cliche. I'm just going to say one sentence, and thank you for that. Um, I think. Disabled populations are, are the remaining one official acceptable form of discrimination in our society. It's too expensive, it's too hard. We wouldn't say that about any other protected class. And so as you think about um, what, what it is you're, you've committed to do, um, there are no acceptable sanctioned, socially you know, tolerable forms of discrimination. And, and so you know, pointing out the fact that you know, 95 of disabled adolescents in a place like Afghanistan or much places Will, will not go on to secondary school, um, it, it tells you that that has been sort of socially acceptable, including in the United States, the shortcomings of our own Americans with Disabilities Act. Yes, the gentleman, yes. Yes, you. Okay, um. The mic is coming. Uh, good morning. My name is Ari Bamad. I'm from the University of Central Florida. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, my question is, drug misuse, substance abuse, and alcohol-related uh, deaths and sexual assault continue to rise uh, specifically amongst college students and high school students in the world today. Our education system continues to recognize the harmful long-term effects of these substances, yet the freedom of choice kind of eclipses this rationality. Do you feel like education systems should take on disciplinary measures to control this problem, or what other potential solutions come to your mind to kind of address this problem amongst these students? Thank you. I know it's a kind of abstract question. I'd hate to divert, but thank you. Well, if you think about it, a lot of the drug abuse, and this goes back to emotional issues, right? So you're struggling with something, you're not coping with it, and then you're turning to this other substance to really fill that void. Um, so I think it goes back to really the beginning. How do you understand what you're feeling and how do you process that? So, um, okay, you might be extremely depressed and it's leading to all of these other things, but unless you really identify that you're depressed or you're dealing with severe anxiety that's leading to, you know, binge eating or whatever it might be, you're not really going to address the problem. So you need to start early on. I think um, oftentimes we work with children as young as three to start teaching about emotions and people are like, how? I'm like, because you need to really lay the foundation to be able to express yourself and understand what coping mechanisms are available to you. So maybe you don't have the luxury of being able to see a, a therapist, or this, but there are coping mechanisms that you can use and you can employ in your life to provide that self-care, to build your self-worth, to build your self-confidence, to be to mitigate some of those um, effects. And I mean, that's, I think. Yeah, and just, just, quick, just quickly on that, in terms of the, certainly in the US system, and I think about this generally, I don't think the public school should be a very active extension of the criminal justice system. In the same way, I don't think the public school should be an active extension of the immigration system. And so, 
there's very much that if we if we want to teach raise children to, to understand their own well-being and their and have their own agency and their own pathway to success, these are all things that have to be covered and taught. We want them to have counselors who can be vigilant and know the children and understand their circumstance. Um, but there need to be other more compassionate systems that help them when they cross lines that are that, that extend beyond what an educational system should do. Thank you. So uh, another round of questions. Let me go one, two, and three. So yes. Hi, my name. Hi, my name is Tanatsu Ahamadziripi. I'm from Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa. I'm an international student from Zimbabwe. And when it comes to thinking about asset-based development and creating new wheels, how do we empower communities to become change makers in themselves? Because no one wants to see that community improve and change more than the people who are in it. So how do we empower them with those tools or materials? And how do we promote such a model in the nonprofit sector itself that puts those people first? I think we were talking about it in the morning. You have our communities in general are taught that you don't have the right to be here in the first place, you know? You don't have the, as I said, you said actually, you said that in the US people are so big on the rights, women rights, girls rights, that right, this right. And in other part of the world, world um, the rights are not even taught in the first place. Um, but if you're taught in a different way, then most of the time, the right is seen as a privilege. I'm going to be honest. Um, I remember my mom used to tell me that it's your privilege that you go to school. My mother, who went to school herself, she thought that it's a privilege for me to go to school. My cousin had to become the first position holder in her school so that she could go to the same school like her brother did, who used to fail all the time, but she couldn't fail. So we have to teach our community elders sort of walk with them through this uh, pathway where yes, it's your right to ask for a school. I don't know how many times I have actually fought with my community leaders, but then taken them to the uh, place where they were supposed to ask for like the governor has, oh, why is our school not open? Why is it not until grade 12? Why are the teachers not paid? The, the elders wouldn't ask. They're like, oh, how can I ask a governor this thing? because they don't know that they can do that. It's, it's the sort of thing that you have to do. So sometimes you have to be that change, you have to be that teacher, and it's okay to be young and teach that. But be kind in your, uh, uh, when you're approaching them, and don't be the sort of person who's like, oh, I'm gonna teach you. No, let's learn together how we can transition from being stuck in this place to a better community uh, living situation. I think that's where it comes, but also at the same time, um, you have to work on the needs, on the asks, on how can we better the solution. And you have to show it to them, the community elders, the young people, the mothers, the big part of the community, the mothers, who have to send their daughters to school or their sons to the school. They have to know what is happening there. I think that's the best way to transition, even if you don't have governments, even if you don't have nonprofits. If the community comes together, I always believe people are the power. So when they are all together, you can make things happen, yeah. The question of collective action is one of the most difficult questions. How do we uh, actually implement collective action is one of the difficult ones. And guys, this is also your job. But anyway, second, second question in this round. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shamim. Uh, I am from University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, I'm originally from Pakistan. I just finished my PhD um, in epidemiology. And I, like everyone else in this room, I have you know dreams and plans to do some great things in future. But we know sometimes things don't go according to a plan. So my question for you is, could you share one professional experience where something didn't go according to the plan? And what did you learn from that experience? Oh, Thank I love you. that question. <laughs> I, I was jumping to go first, but it's not my panel. Go, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, and this cannot leave this auditorium, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Please don't, they still find us, <laughs> please. <laughs> so I'm 17, 
I'm crazy. I have this notepad. I keep on telling my dad, this solution is going to work for this community, and we're going to do it. You're going to give me money, because nobody else is going to invest in me. And my father had the money, so I was like, you're going to give me $2,000. And he's like, you know what? We'll think about it. I'm like, I don't want to think about it. I need the money right now. So in the morning, I get $2,000. I go to Kabul. I get the NGO registered. And I have this backing from this one NGO that I cannot name right now. <laughs> but <laughs> So they're like, we're going to fund you. Just get your license number, and you can start with this community. And I'm like, OK. I get all my friends, everyone on this place, you know. We get registered. We get everything done. Uh, we send them the proposal. And 10 days later, they're like, we cannot fund you. <laughs> and I'm crying. My eyes are this big, and I'm teary. I'm like, what am I going to tell my dad, you know? What am I going to tell him that, yes, he gave me the money, and I wasted it, and nobody even believes in my idea in the first place? Um, fun story. I still worked uh, despite not having the money. I took more money from my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> somebody had to. <laughs> so, 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 so I took the money, and I started, uh, like, you know, five tablets. And we started with the most remote space. And uh, I started working with Durdana, the girl that was educated a year ago. And we go to these communities and we talk to them. And sometimes they're like, oh, you're infidel and you're doing this. I'm like, yeah, whatever. But so we get the stuff done. And then after two years, a radio channel covers our stuff. And guess what? This NGO wants to find us now. <laughs> they want to work with us now. They want to have our logo on their label. And that time I was like, OK, do I? become this person who's like, you know what, I don't want you guys. I will do it on my own. Or do I become more pragmatic? And I was like, you know what, we need to take their money. We need to take their money. <laughs> and we took their money. And we did amazing things with their money. We still do. <laughs> so I think at times, you have to learn. You have to transition. And there will be your day. Everyone has their own day. And you'll have that day. So t sometimes there are failures. And I remember crying my eyes. I thought, my life is over at 17. That's it. My father is, my mother is not going to allow me to go out of the house anymore or something like that. But yeah, well, things change. So I think for me, take that risk. Move further, even if like you know nobody's believing in you, you have to believe in yourself. You have to 100% believe in yourself. And you have to take your father's money for it. So. <laughs> It's too good a story. It's too good a story to follow. But it does make me feel like we should have had your father on this panel too. <laughs> uh, there's probably two sides of the story. Um, <clears throat> to what you're saying, like, if we are going to decolonize this industry, if we are going to democratize this industry, um, if we are going to be true to our commitments to be anti-racist, uh, we're going to have to take risks on a lot of our local organizations that don't have infrastructure. And certainly, you know, the question is failure, like. I have, over the course of my career, funded a lot of organizations that couldn't pull it off. And there were compliance issues, or there were performance issues, and whatever. But you don't call it failure, because you are seeding the ecosystem. And that's just the risk you've got to take if you're going to be, if you're going to have the integrity of saying, like, not everything can get run out of Washington, D.C., or run out of capital cities in the, you know, in, in the north. So I was, I was recently on a panel last week, and they were asking me sort of lessons learned and I was like, look, plan for everything that you plan that's going to happen, it's going to go wrong. So I have a plan B. <laughs> so, um, but no, really, it's just being that uh, ability to come back on your feet and say, OK, well, this didn't work out as planned. I, I didn't get the funding that I had hoped, or uh, this wasn't the right partnership. And just saying, well, what can I take from this? And how can I do this better the next time? And so it's really just a continuous learning curve and you have to check in with yourself of what maybe you could have done better in that circumstance or how you could have handled it and then just kind of continuing and improving as you go. Very good. Uh, guys, I promise that I follow the time that were given to me and, and unfortunately I cannot uh, take more, more, more questions uh, and uh, we are going to close the panel. Uh, Thank you so much. It was uh, extraordinary. I learned a lot. Uh, I think that there are a lot of lessons uh, uh, that emerge from this panel. I, uh, I think that the work that you are doing is extraordinary, guys. And uh, I am happy to be a human being uh, among uh, the three of you. Uh, so uh, that's uh, let's uh, uh, do a, a round of applause to our panelists. <laughs>